All right, my name is Mark Herman. I volunteered to participate in this book study. And I'm, I'm really glad I did, I'll tell you, because when I first saw the book and saw the name Abundance, I, I wasn't sure I even really understood what that all meant, abundance of what. And so as I read the book, um, I really got a great understanding of, of a lot of different issues, which we're gonna talk about today. Um, as it says right here on this first uh, PowerPoint, page, you know, it's technology that's driving all of this. And a lot of things have happened over the years, and it's, it's accelerating right now. Um, and it's all really going to be for generations to come that are going to benefit from what we're laying down as the groundwork um, recently. The previous uh, two sections, I just want to do a quick review of them. Uh, part one and two, I think the biggest thing I took away from that is an example that was in the book where they talked about an orange tree. And the orange tree went in, all the fruit was picked from the lower branches, that was it. Well then technology came along, invented a ladder, and now people could take the oranges from the top of the tree. So a very simple example of, of uh, the abundance was there, we just couldn't use it until we had the technology to get us to the next stage. And then part three and four, you know, we talked a little bit more in detail about how the abundance develops. And the good example that they use there in the book is how the body is made up of 10 trillion cells. And how do they all work together so we can stand up and, you know, do our daily activities. And it really is about specialization and then working together. And that's a fairly simple example of really how abundance can be developed. And again, because of technology, we're seeing things accelerate at a fairly quick rate. So that's kind of what, in a nutshell, was covered in the first couple chapters. Now, chapter five and six that I'm taking today has to do with where are some of these opportunities existing. There's a lot of areas that, uh, for abundance. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the ones that were in the book, energy, education, healthcare, and freedom. And the majority of my time, I'm going to focus on energy uh, simply because energy drives everything. And it drives our ability, you'll see, is how it relates to issues of education, healthcare, and certainly our own freedoms. And, you know, with the use of uh, technology, we're, we're creating this innovation that we need at a much faster rate. Um, there will be some examples I'll show you of the risks that we took and the failures that we had and how this is so important for our future. To start with, um, there was something I read recently um, by Mark Zucker, and the key point I wanna make there as you look through the things that he talks about is the inclusive community. And this is the site that if you have a chance to go through and read it, it's, it's quite telling. I think it's well said. I think Mark is positioning himself for his future to be very influential in this country. And so quickly, I'll just read through a couple of things that he says here on, his, on this uh, Facebook page. Um, across the world, there are people left behind by globalization and the movements uh, for withdrawing and there are movements for withdrawing from uh, the global connection. Mark is very concerned that as, the, uh, as his company has expanded, uh, developing the social inter infrastructure for community that people, some people have been left behind and it's his goal to try and provide a way for people to all be included in the development of our abundance. And so that article is worth taking a look at in more detail, it's quite lengthy. Again, uh, I'm gonna focus on uh, those areas that we, I just mentioned. Uh, again, technology is of course the key to this. I have several YouTubes that I'm gonna show you during this because I think they help give visual uh, insight into this whole area of how technology is creating such abundance. Uh, this um, YouTube here is uh, a young, man uh, who talks about how energy, if you have energy, you've got power. And when you have power, you've got everything. 
And so uh, let's just listen to this kid. It's, it's quite interesting. This is pretty cool. A real life Dexter's laboratory. Yeah, that's what he said. A whiz kid with a very powerful idea. Max Lahan shares his story in tonight's Someone to Know. Do you think a 13 year old could change the world? Well, this one might change your mind. Dressed in his lab coat. Yeah, I, I wear this uh, fairly often. Max Lahan sits in his parents' old boiler room, converted into a lab. I am in a boiler room right now. And he ponders the future often. The future that I imagine is the future, frankly, that we all imagine. He wants to make the world a better place. And to do that, you need one single thing. If you got energy, you got power, you have everything. So to solve this problem, a few months ago, Max took the matter into his own hands and created this electromagnetic harvester out of a coffee can, some wire, two coils, and a spoon. This cost me 14 bucks. The harvester conducts radio waves, thermal, and static energy and turns it into electricity. This wire takes the energy from the air. Down below here, we turn it from AC into DC. So we take the device outside and wrap up Max's brother into a string of LED lights. Bing! <laughs> a $14 invention was able to do that. So imagine the same harvester on a scale 20 times larger. I'm very proud of him. Max's family is thrilled with what he's accomplished, and nobody is more impressed than his twin brother, Okay, Jack. so that goes on a little ways. Uh, I'll cut it off again. If you have access to this PowerPoint, which I think you should, you could watch the whole thing. Uh, the kid just is telling it just the way it is. It's the technology driving opportunity. And once you start using that technology, uh, anything is possible. And he, he showed that taking and taking, creating energy out of the air. Uh, right now we are in an area era of energy abundance. Um, you, you've heard, I'm sure, all of the issues with um, shortages years ago on oil. Now we have a surplus. There's a surplus of natural gas. Prices are down, uh, which is all good for us as consumers. It's probably not the best energy sources when we have renewable available, but you'll see how this is part of the, an important process of how technology is helping us get to a much better end. Um, what's available out there is probably a lot more uh, energy than what we really um, will be needing in terms of even the carbon-based fuels. Uh, but United States and China, they're the big energy users and it's because of them that they're reinvesting into alternative energy, which really will make a change for the future. What will really take to, to make a change happen, I, I really can't say for sure. Maybe some of you have thoughts about this. Is there anybody that has thought, you know, how do we get ourselves back to where we're driving ourselves to being more concerned about the use of renewable fuels? As is, is there any thought anybody might have? It's, it's, it's really kind of out there kind of question. Are you asking for comments right now or later? Yeah, right now. Okay, this is Pat Higby, and um, I'm, my cup is also half full. I was, I, I have a good feeling about the future. Um, not only that we've got so many renewable energy um, resources available, um, but that we have the technology to use. I have a Chevy Volt, and uh, it's the old technology, because it's from 2012. Isn't it amazing how quickly things become old? But the idea that we're able to drive around using electricity made by our wind turbines, I think is a really, really great thing. And yes, I think there are other energy resources that we'll be seeing in the future too. Um, but that's enough for me, I'll, I'll mute again. Well, I think, you know, if we think about that, if, if there was another major oil spill, or if there was something that happened internationally that would cause uh, a reduction in the availability of oil, we could very quickly accelerate moving toward renewable energy. We are on the path, we've just slowed down, 
recently because of the cheap cost of current carbon-based fuels. But that's not forever, and I think that could change very quickly. When we're ready to fully accelerate and use the energy that comes from the sun, this is an example of where you can see the amount of energy available from the sun, which they're saying is 23,000 uh, terawatt years. And I don't have a clue how much that is equating to, but they do show this in this example of how much energy we're currently using on the right there from carbon-based versus what the sun has available. And so you can see from this example that the sun not only creates all the solar we need for solar cells, but also it creates the winds we have for wind energy. So the sun is the major contributor to future of what we need for uh, renewable energy. Um, so as far as the world um, goes right now, it's, it looks pretty good in terms of what's coming down um, the path for us. The technology is accelerating. And even in, in, in the underdeveloped countries, there's a lot going on. And, and some of this you may have seen before, but I did want to show you some of these things uh, so that you have a good understanding of, of what is actually going on. This one here, um, let's just take a quick look at it. There may be some ads in here I have to get rid of. As soon as I left the hospital after a DVT blood clot, I sure had a lot to think about. What about the people I care? There's nothing obviously different about the airport in George. It's a popular golf destination, so plenty of tourists pass through, along with business people hoping to strike a deal on a fairway. There's just a screen on the wall to hint at what makes this terminal unique. It's the first solar-powered airport on the continent. The switch to solar was driven by debilitating power cuts last year, caused by old and poorly maintained infrastructure, blackouts that some estimates say cost the economy up to 700 80 million dollars a month. Instead of um, getting used to load shedding, we rather invested into renewable energy and in that we relieving the stress on the national grid because the demand that we would have taken from the grid is now freed up for, for elsewhere. The solar panels also utilize space close to the airport that would otherwise be empty. The project's been so successful, two more airports are converting to solar and others are considering making the switch. Not only is solar powering the airport, but any excess electricity is fed into the national grid. Solar experts say solar panels have become a lot more affordable in the last five years, creating lots of opportunities. There's been a quite a successful uh, government uh, business partnership where uh, your companies uh, bid to build these power stations and then afterwards once they've built them they sell the electricity to the national uh, power supplier and that seems to have worked very well. Government leaders hope about 40% of South African electricity needs should be met by renewable energy by 2030. And how about a solar powered haircut? A small panel powers this portable barbershop. You know I've looked at so many products from solars but this one I felt like it's like a few parts in one. This boss got everything. You got your head clipper on it. You got your phone char multi charger. The income means he can pay his children's school fees, and because the box also comes with a light, there's no excuse for them to skip their homework if there's a power cut. Tanya Page, Al Jazeera, George, South Africa. So that is sort of gives you some insight into what's going on around the world. There's there's a lot that can be done to help countries that are underdeveloped. And because of the cost to produce these portable solar panels, like you saw there in that one example, things are going to change pretty quickly on that continent. And you, you hear about China and the United States and European countries, but there's a lot that's happening in India, Africa, and also South America. Now, this next YouTube is an example of hey, what Mark, is, Yes. Can I interrupt for a while? We cannot see your YouTube video. We, we, we see only blue color. Uh, we cannot see your YouTube video. So, None of them you've been able to see? 
So I was wondering, like everybody is not seeing that video, or we on we are not seeing that video. You haven't seen any of them. No, it's only blue, blank blue color. Ah, uh, but you can hear it. Yeah, we can hear it, but we cannot see the video. Okay, is there a fix for that? Mm, I Mark, are you sharing your screen? Are you sharing like your entire computer screen? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, you're not just sharing PowerPoint, right? If, you, if you're just sharing PowerPoint, we won't see your computer screen. Okay. You play the video. If you're sharing your computer screen, we can see your PowerPoint and the video when you play it. All right. Let's, let me, how do I, uh, hmm. Down at the bottom of the thing under share screen, see if there's an option to choose the entire screen or just PowerPoint. Okay. And if there's an option to choose the entire screen, uh, choose the share screen. I think that might be our only option. Otherwise, okay. if that doesn't clear it up, I'm going to assume there's some kind of software uh, mismatch, um, which is quite possible. Okay, it says resume share. And new share. Let's see. Okay. Um, PowerPoint. Oh, I got to share my desktop, don't I? Right. That's it. Ah, okay. I clicked on the wrong one. I think you, yep. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> okay. I bet we'll be able to see it now. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. We'll be back to where we were. Okay, here, let's try this. This is creating energy, again, out of, out of the air. Just, can you see, here, see that? Okay. So what that's showing us is free energy. I mean, it, it, it's out there thinking about that, it, applying that to countries that are underdeveloped where we could capture the magnetic fields and wave energies to create electricity for people. And it's up to the major countries of the world to allow for the development of this technology and it's happening maybe a little bit slowed up right now but it's going to be back in in a big way i'm sure in the very near future some of this is going on as you could see already in other countries uh, I, I want to bring it home to you guys so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on in iowa it's great to talk about what's happening in china and us and in europe and africa but we're doing a really great job here in this state. Uh, I think anybody who has spent some time here knows what a great state it is. Um, there's opportunities for people. And what we're really doing is developing renewable energy at a fairly high rate. Uh, right now, let's see, Catherine, I, your photo is awful big and it's in the way of my PowerPoint, but 
can, how do I make that smaller? I, I don't know. I don't know why my photo would be up there big on your screen. Oh, wait. Um, there it goes. Now I'm good. Oh, okay. Now okay. I got it off to the side. All right. Thank you. Okay. Or whatever. I don't know what I did. All right. Um, I, Iowa is number one in the United States. That's Maybe you don't know this, but we have 41% of our energy that we use in our homes in Iowa and businesses coming from renewable energy. By 2015, by the end, will be 58% because there's a huge $1.2 billion project that's been approved and started in Iowa. And Mid-America, of course, is behind this uh, in a very big way. And it's the goal of the state of Iowa to have 89% uh, of our power coming from wind turbines in two th by 2020. Then you add to that what we're doing in solar. Uh, you can see from the stats there uh, that we are having more and more companies every year participating. More people are putting solar panels on their roofs. Uh, those panels even are looking like regular shingles. So you don't even know that you have a, a solar roof. And then you add to that the fact that more and more electric vehicles are starting to show up in the state of Iowa. Have any of you seen any of the charging stations that are now being um, put in place, uh, maybe mostly tied to IV stores or something? Has anyone seen that? No, if not, we've got one here where I live in Bettendorf, and it's really neat. I've already seen cars. Uh, they usually uh, back in, I guess. Um, they back in, they plug in, they do their grocery shopping, and they can get a 75% charge for their, of a total charge of 100%, and they can get it in 20 minutes. And Tesla has a program that you pay them X amount of dollars a year, then you don't even have to use a credit card. You just punch in a security code, you plug up, and you power up on these things whenever you want. And you know, Tesla's coming out with their new $35,000 vehicle and they've already pre-sold 400,000. So we are moving as a country in a very big way towards uh, renewable energy, especially in the areas of like electric vehicles. Now this doesn't have anything to do with the book. Uh, I just want to throw this in here because I, I've read on this before and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the issue, but anytime you are using energy that comes from a coal or natural gas, a carbon-based uh, fuel um, energy source, I'm sorry. And, and even when in the manufacturing of ethanol, this has been a little bit of an issue. There's a lot of water that gets used. And the Olagala Olagala uh, aquifer is, is, is in trouble, basically. Um, we're, we're sucking all the ground water out and it cannot replenish. This is water that is hundreds of millions of years old. It's from ice ages and it was trapped and some of it is coming down from the states north of us of uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, but a lot of states like Iowa and parts of Nebraska, are, we're using that water up from the, uh, from the ground and it's not making it to where it's really needed for um, plants that are trying to grow in the states of Texas and, and uh, Kansas and Nebraska. So if we move towards renewable energy with the use of technology, we're going to help reduce this problem of all these gallons of water that are used in the manufacturing of, uh, uh, all the, uh, manufacturing of carbon based fuels. Uh, they did a study in California and by moving toward wind power, they've, they saved 73 billion gallons of water in one year. Has anyone uh, seen the um, circles that are on the ground in Kansas, Nebraska when you fly over them? Yeah, that's, that's where the water is coming from to grow wheat and corn and soybeans is from that uh, Olagala aquifer and you can see a picture of it there. That's in the center of the United States. It's deep, deep water. Um, there is, uh, let's see if this comes through okay. This is an article, I believe, that just talks about it. So um, what happens when the water's gone? Um, that part of the country has always been our breadbasket, for uh, including Iowa, but there's a lot of wheat that's grown there. And um, if they don't have that water, there could be some issues in the future. So we're gonna have to come up with 
alternative ways to create abundance in food. And uh, you'll see that we are starting to do that, including Iowa. So uh, alternative fuels, you know, Iowa with ethanol, we've, we've been part of a transition. And I think over time, you're going to find that there's going to probably be less and less need for that as we get to something that is totally uh, renewable. Um, here's the part that is maybe hard to agree with initially, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Exxon, companies like Exxon who have grown and based all of their profitability on selling us um, energy that uh, in many times we feel they don't do a good job protecting us from the possibilities of um, oil spills and, and other things that happen. And those things do happen. But Ener Exxon has the money. <laughs> and that's the reality. And they just recently, not too many years ago, got involved with SGI. And I want you to see, see this um, story that was done on them. It's about using pond scum to manufacture energy for cars. Our partner in Agi Research is Synthetic Genomics. ExxonMobil focuses primarily on making the Agi more productive, increasing... Okay, I may have to shut down a computer here, a different one. For some reason, I'm using... The, their ability to take yeah, energy from the sun and CO2 from the atmosphere and make uh, our feedstock for fuels. We also bring an understanding of the agile physiology that then we transfer to SGI to help them complement their research endeavors. In 2009, ExxonMobil came to Synthetic Genomics primarily because of foundational technology and the role of synthetic biology, knowing that we could deploy that technology to uh, take natural strains, natural viral strains in the environment, and domesticate those strains for biofuels production. And after a few years, we realized that we had to have a greater focus on the fundamental biology of algae. Going back to fundamentals meant really understand the basic process that the algae used to make the product that we want to make. Now where we are after four years, we are at an understanding of this metabolism, this lipid production, which is probably unsurmounted in the algal field or even in the phototrophic space as we see it today. In the past seven years, you know, I've worked with a team here of more than 50 people working on this program. Engineers, physiologists, molecular biologists, and they're all passionate about what they do. Having a partner like Exxon Mobil, who's had the patience and diligence to keep with this program for that duration, has been fantastic. Our partnership with SGI continues. What we want to do in the next phase is to increase the growth rate of the algae and to increase the amount of fat that they make so that we can get closer to a performance that will allow us to make affordable and scalable transportation fuels. Okay, that was just uh, simply on pond scum, so to speak, being used in the area of to create transportation fuels. This could be done anywhere in the world, and this is just one of many different ways that we're looking at alternative energy sources. And it's because of the wealth that exists in some of these major corporations that they can help fund this and get us to where we need to be so we can have renewable energy. Now you'll see from the example down below, I, I won't walk you through all the details on that, but bottom line is uh, in, a, in 19, uh, let's see, if, if you go to the bottom there, uh, if you just said, okay, we want enough pond scum fuel for 250 million automobiles, what would it take? Well, right now at 25 miles per gallon, 12,000 miles a year, it would take 19% of the acres of Nevada. But if we get 50 miles per gallon, which we are quickly moving to that, like the Volt, in, in a sense, they, there is some uh, energy cost, but so they estimate, uh, I know uh, someone out there has a Volt, uh, they're still saying it's close to 100 miles a gallon, if not more. So in that sense, you could get the, cost, the acres needed to produce enough fuel for cars in this country down to 8,000 acres, which when you take a desert area, that's fantastic. It's a great use of that resource. So here, technology being funded 
uh, through one of the major corporations with an independent program that they put together with SGI, having fantastic results. Has anyone ever seen or heard of uh, using this kind of thing before to create energy pond scum? Um, it's relatively new. Uh, as you could hear from that, it's in the last three or four years where it's really become visible. Now, uh, taking this back to um, the continent of Africa, uh, they have some advantages, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but think about the fact that they don't have any copper lines. They don't have any, any need to um, have the uh, phone lines. So, you know, for power lines and phone lines, they don't have them. And now we're moving quickly into a society where the infrastructure is very different from what it's been in the past. In this country, we've got a transition. China, they don't have to transition because they're, they're skipping that whole step. And so is Africa. So they have some advantages in that respect. Um, but we'll, we'll, um, we'll get through this just fine. It's just that we have an infrastructure that needs a lot of work and within a, a you know, I don't know how many years, but within a half a century, certainly, we may not even need it because of where we're going with all of this. So the key, real key here is being able to harness the energy, um, especially from the sun. In Africa, they say that because of where it is located on the continent, that one square kilometer uh, will produce basically an energy about 1.5 million barrels of oil. That's the what it equals. That's just to give you some idea of how much potential Africa has to create energy. And it is possible too with the uh, use of wind power on their continent that they could export energy to Europe in the in the future, which that would be amazing. What a development that would be for that continent, for all those countries involved. And it might eliminate a lot of issues, There's certainly hunger and, and uh, water issues and, and hopefully war, because that is a, a continual problem on that continent. So there is energy uh, abundance in all parts of uh, sun and wind and alternative fuels. This one um, video I want you to see right now uh, is very interesting. This has, the, it's a little, I'll cut it short. I'm not going to have it play the full eight minutes, but it has to do with alternative ways to use the sun's energy to help us in our everyday needs here. Solar freaking roadways. What are they? They're solar freaking roadways. What do they want from me? Well, they're solar freaking roadways. Okay, so actually this time, what is it? It's technology that replaces all roadways, parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, tarmacs, bike paths, and outdoor recreation surfaces with solar panels. And not just lifeless, boring solar panels. Smart, microprocessing, interlocking, hexagonal solar units. No more useless asphalt and concrete just sitting there baking in the sun, needing to be repaved, and filling with potholes that ruin your axle alignment on your sweet ride, bro. These are intelligent solar panels. Replace the panel at a time if damaged or malfunctioning. They're covered with a new tempered glass material that has been designed and tested to meet all impact, load, and traction requirements. Oh, and did I mention that they're also solar panels? They generate electricity. They generate capital. They pay for themselves, and they keep paying more because we're not going to run out of sun for like 15 billion years. That lowers the cost of energy, unlike those bills in the mail that keep going up. And it's clean energy. Everyone can theoretically drive an electric car with no pollution and a minimal carbon footprint. Can you imagine how good our cities would smell? How much healthier we'd all be? Excuse me, young man. Am I being led to believe that this thing is some sort of thing? Yes, it's a thing. A real thing. And clean energy is only its primary function. Grab a notepad because this is where it gets interesting. For those in the north, the panels use energy they collect to power elements to keep the surface temperature a few degrees above freezing. They're heated. No more ice and snow on roads causing traffic delays, accidents, and injury. No more shoveling your driveway and sidewalk. No salt corroding your car or wasting tax money on snow removal. And you can ride your bike or drive your motorcycle all year round. Whoa! Every panel has 
series of LED lights on the circuit board that can be programmed to make landscape designs, warning signs, parking lot configurations, whatever. These roads never have to have lanes repainted, just reprogrammed to whatever we choose or whatever works best. Imagine a highway road lighting up ahead of you. How much safer it would be to drive at night. There'd be improved visibility for pilots landing on solar landing strips. Imagine walking onto a solar recreation court and choosing a sports configuration. Want to play basketball? Cool. Kids want to play hopscotch in Foursquare? Awesome. Ball hockey? Done. And with LED lights under your feet, it's going to look like freaking Tron out there. But real, because this is the real world. Whoa. But these panels are also pressure sensitive, so they can detect when large debris like branches or boulders have fallen onto the road, or if an animal is crossing. It can warn drivers with LED text to slow down for an obstruction. I'm very, you know, environmentally conscious. Good, because solar roadways use as much recycled material in their production as possible. Plus, the roadways have two channels that form what's called a cable corridor that runs concurrently with the roadways themselves. One part houses electrical cables, meaning power lines, data lines, fiber optics, and high-speed internet, which replaces the need for telephone poles and hanging wires that can be damaged during storms causing power outages or become extremely dangerous if severed either as fallen live wires or buried cables. The other channel captures and filters storm water and melted snow, moving them either to a treatment facility or treating them on-site, greatly decreasing the amount of pollution that enters our soil, lakes, rivers, and oceans. I'm kind of broke, bruh. Yeah, no kidding. The economy is in the toilet. Do you realize how many thousands of jobs this could create and sustain? Talk about a hypodermic adrenaline shot to the heart of the man manufacturing and infrastructure sector. And it pays for itself. They're solar freaking roadways. Um, I have concerns about the future. Is this thing even possible? I told you, yes. Solar roadway technology was invented by engineering couple Julie and Scott Broussard in 2006. Two of the sweetest people in the world who met when they were three and four years old. Listen to these two. Hi, we're Scott and Julie Broussard, inventors of solar roadways. It goes on for a little while uh, talking about the inventors of... It's it's really worth watching the whole thing. There's about another four minutes left of it. It's just an indication that and it, uh, Catherine, did you say that there were some of these in place somewhere that you knew of? Was that you? Yeah, I'm I'm here, Mark. Yeah, actually, I had read just recently. I I would say within the last month that there were tests that were going on. If I can't remember now, if I said it was in uh, Milwaukee. Didn't I say like it was Wisconsin, like Milwaukee, something like that? I do believe so. Or was it Michigan? One of the two. It was either Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or it was somewhere Michigan. So, okay. uh, okay. but if you if you run a real quick internet search, you can find that there is an ongoing test at this point in time. So yeah, it's just in the beginning stages of its use, and and of course it has to be tested for years to make sure that it's applicable to all the things they're talking about. But all of that has possibilities. So energy abundance with the use of technology in this country, anywhere in the world, we are on the verge and it's, it's happening. But, you know, the biggest thing with energy is storage. And that has been a problem. Um, lithium ion batteries, I think we've all heard about the problems in cell phones. Uh, these batteries, which are used in darn near everything, have the possibility of doing what they've done. I think that I heard that because of the high salt content in the manufacturing of the Samsung batteries that they used, that that's what caused their fires. So something as simple as a misjudgment uh, on someone's part can cause all kinds of issues. So there are more need for batteries. There's more need for safer batteries. And you're gonna see a couple things here that are pretty amazing, uh, including at the end here, a plastic battery. So we are on the verge with technology to develop storage of energy. Uh, I don't know how many have seen the uh, 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 Elon Musk's facility out there in, in, Vegas, in uh, Nevada, but I wanted you to take a quick look just to see what's going on. Tesla wants to fill the world with electric cars, but it's going to need this factory to do so. Thirty minutes outside of Reno, Tesla is building its own factory to keep up with electric car battery demand and drive down the prices. The finished Gigafactory will be 1.9 million square feet. What we're seeing today is only one-sixth of that final size. But it's already building the battery packs in its structure. 
partner Panasonic is building out the cell manufacturing portion, and the companies hope to actually be building the cells themselves on site by the end of the year. Most of the battery demand is for the new $35,000 Model 3. Now there are already 400,000 pre-orders for the new Tesla. The factory itself is being built in sections. What's currently erected are sections A, B, and C. Section D is up, but it's mostly bare steel beams. Construction of Section E began two days ago and it's already got a skeletal outline of one of its portions. And because the whole building is really just a series of buildings connected together, Tesla can continue to expand if there's increased battery demand. The whole gigantic structure serves as a piece of Elon Musk's master plan to build electric cars for the masses. Now, that plan has been recently updated to include solar panels on cars and large transport vehicles. More cars equals more batteries. Hey everyone, Tesla doesn't just want to build the electric car. It wants to power the battery it builds with its supercharging network and its own solar panels. It's a bit like Ford creating its own petroleum company. So like future gigafactories would just combine um, pack production, cell production and vehicle production in, in one, one big facility. And to do this, it's ready to build more gigafactories. Obviously long term it's, term it's going to make sense to have a gigafactory in Europe and, and one in China. But ultimately wherever th there's a huge amount of uh, demand for the end product and where the shipping costs start to become significant, um, then the obvious way to optimize that is to at least put the gigafactory on the same continent. But to make that happen, it needs to finish this giant gigafactory out here in the Nevada desert. Yeah, there's a lot. If you go to the uh, YouTube and, and, you know, search uh, Elon Musk, you can find all kinds of, or Gigafactory, all kinds of different um, uh, videos that have been done in, from five minutes to 50 minutes. Just quite interesting. Well, that's one aspect of it, but really um, to move into something that is the next generation of batteries, there's the liquid metal battery, which uh, again is a project that started in a, a small company, probably in someone's garage, and now is being funded by some other major company. And uh, this is right around the corner also. So take a look at this. Welcome to Ambry. We are the liquid metal battery commercializing technology company that will for the first time separate the demand from electricity with the supply of electricity everywhere all the time. This idea started on a whiteboard and it started about eight years ago. The early work started at MIT uh, and at the beginnings it was very much a high level concept and we thought about uh, storing electricity for the grid. We've got all these uh, generating plants that have 40% of their capacity sitting there most of the time. If we had storage, then we'd be able to better utilize the, the already existing capacity. So that means we'd, we'd generate much less uh, in the way of emissions per unit electricity uh, generated. That's a lower cost system and that's also a system that can take unlimited amounts of renewables that is generating whenever the wind blows or the sun shines. I think I was a bit uh, different than many of my classmates in that I, I didn't really care about getting papers and, and great publications and academic journals. I wanted to work on a project and do research on a project and, and get a PhD on a, on a project that could impact the world. So that is, is another uh, way that energy is being stored. And when I was doing the research, I ran across this concept that's out there where soon, it's, a, it's available now, it's just a little costly. You can get a refrigerator sized battery for your home and it uses water, magnesium and antimony. Oh, salt water that is, not regular water. Again. They don't want to use water because it's a precious commodity and becoming more so all the time. So this little refrigerator would sit in the corner in your garage, let's say, and you would feed your solar energy or wind energy, whatever, into it. And that it could store the energy for your home for a 
24 to 48 hour period if there was no energy available to it. It could store that much. It could power absolutely everything in your home. And it would last for about uh, 25 years, I believe, without any maintenance. You don't have to do a thing to it. And right now, I think the cost is around $7,500. In the future, it's going to become very affordable. And we're going to have energy storage in our homes to do whatever we need when we need. And we can use the solar energy from the roof of our home to accomplish it. So that, we're going that way, and it's happening fairly quickly. Um, the battery issue, uh, I'm not going to, I'm just going to click on this to show you, but there are now plastic batteries. And I didn't read about this. I just heard about this on Science Friday the other day. And um, that's it right there. I, I have no clue exactly how it works. Has anybody heard of this? No? I, I don't know. It, it, if we can get away from the lithium ion stuff and move towards something that is uh, more environmentally friendly and safer, uh, we're probably, uh, of course, much better off to do that. So plastic batteries, they're around the corner, I think. Um, I'm not, I'm going to go through this real quick, but just, just know that when in your, in the state of California, they sell most of the electric cars and that's because they're forced to do so basically by California's own laws. You, when you sell a car that uses regular carbon-based fuels, um, even a hybrid has a gas engine in it that uses fuels uh, like gasoline, um, you, you, get, um, you have to sell so many cars that are electric only. And so that's why there's a formula for it. I won't go through it, but that's why California sells so many cars because they literally have to sell the electric cars at a loss. Uh, you get a tax credit for buying them, but the dealership, that on average, loses $4,000 per vehicle when they sell it over their cost, and they're forced to do so by the state of California where they do their business. I don't know. Has anyone heard of the, uh, the new Bolt, B-O-L-T, that's coming out? Okay, it's brand new. Uh, it's been introduced in California. It's coming to the rest of the country probably later in 1718. Uh, it's not replacing the Volt. Uh, it's just a new vehicle, and it's addressing the one problem that all of us have had with electric cars, uh, myself included. I travel a lot. A, a electric vehicle that only takes me 60 miles won't work. But the Bolt will go over 200 miles on a charge. So now that changes things. And they've done a lot of research, and they really think that if they can put a vehicle like this uh, – in our garages for 30, 35,000 a year, and uh, that we can take the energy off from our roof or however we get it, and we can travel 200 miles without recharging it, or there's electric charge stations like Tesla has, it changes the future, and it's, it's here. I mean, it's happening right now. So again, technology is moving energy forward. This is a, com a, co a company, this is a community in Fairfield, Iowa that is totally energy independent, totally food independent. It is outside of Fairfield and it has been there for, I think about 10 years. Uh, they sell, there's some, you can see there's uh, empty lots still, they have lots to sell. You buy a lot and you become part of the community. It's not a commune and like in many many years ago but it is a community that works together to uh, be self-sufficient totally self-sufficient right here in Iowa and then to drive down energy use uh, as I see it happening here uh, even though we're going more and more towards renewable energy there's less and less need for energy because on a per person per household basis we're using less energy I did some analysis on my own home, and I found out that over a period of years, you can see I took the same month every year. It's a month where energy use was stable in my home. It happened to have the same number of days. This, there was no change in who lived there. It was just my wife and myself, and uh, we both were working, so our, uh, we were consistently doing the same thing. And even in 2016, I started working out of my home, and yet the energy still went down. So what factors were involved to change 
uh, why my energy decreased over time. Anybody, any thoughts from anybody? Well, one thing for sure is during that time period from 2012, I went from incandescent bulbs to CFLs, the ones with the curly Q, you know, the circle. And now I'm uh, all LED. I also took a television that was using quite a bit of energy. It was a DLP, a digital light processor, and went to um, LED televisions. That went from 1,000 watts of energy to 35 watts of energy. So that those things make a difference. As our society is moving in that direction, there is less and less need for energy. As a matter of fact, some of the power plants around the country are being shut down because there's not enough demand. And it's not because we have less people, it's because we're using less energy. So we are all making changes and technology is helping get us there. All right, enough on energy. So now we move into the other areas uh, but this is uh, not exactly one of them. I just wanted to touch on this because um, food abundance, let's see, yeah. Food abundance is, is something that is, um, we have plenty of this country, but around the world, there isn't. Um, I wanted you to see this because uh, I'm only going to show you a couple minutes on this first video here. It has to do with a fish farm and also um, vertical farming, how they work together. And this is something that can happen here. No need to add soil, pesticides, or even water to this six by eight foot garden, which produces over a hundred pounds of fish and 400 vegetables a year. What kind of food facility is this? For one of our next 500 companies, it's a system about to revolutionize how the world eats. You are literally at the front edge of probably the most important technology that's come down the pike in food in a century. And it will impact more people over the next 25 years than anything else we know of. Portable Farms makes on-site food production facilities using aquaponics, a unique farming technique using fish and plants. When you mix aquaculture, which is raising fish in captivity, feeding them, and raising uh, plants in water, mm -hmm. and what we've done is we've combined the hydroponic component with the aquaculture component. So we raise the fish, use the fish waste to fertilize the plants. Coley first pioneered the concept for portable farms in 1972, while he was a student. It started by having to clean fish tanks at UC Davis. <laughs> so it's like, it's gotta, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I started with a dish pan sitting on top of a fish tank with sand in it. The water's coming in. Plants grew like crazy for two weeks, and then they didn't like the water on their fruits all the time. I'm going to stop it there just for time, because, but there's a lot more to that. It's quite an interesting... Uh, conversation that he has there. And then this thing, uh, well, Dr. Zeman and I, we know about 3D, and most of you do know about 3D, because uh, University of Northern Iowa has been very successful with their TechWorks lab. But what about 3D printed food? <laughs> Believe it or not, it does exist. I'm just going to show you, this is not a video, I, this is just, uh, you can go to the site and you can read for yourself. They are actually creating food from a 3D printer. I don't have a clue how it's done. But um, it's just to show you technology is working in many different ways, including food. Uh, the last thing on food then is that Iowa has moved into fish farms on a pretty big scale. There are several of them around the state that I know of already exist. And there's a new one that's being developed near Harlan, Iowa, that's going to be a salmon fish farm. And you can see there that the fish farm for salmon is different because salmon have to move through the water uh, uh, pretty in a different way than other fish do, like tilapia. Uh, and so they are going to create circular areas and probably, you know, create an environment that hopefully is close to what they normally have to deal with as far as salmon goes. Uh, I remember having tilapia back 
in uh, 1996 that was kind of grown in a on a fish farm. It actually was grown in the basement area of an old power plant. And uh, that was done in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It was pretty amazing back then that it's been going on for quite some time. Now, education abundance is, is the other area, since we're done now with energy and a little bit on the food. This was, um, as I read in the book, it, it interesting. As you read, you can see there for yourself. But what this test was is a professor took and actually gave children in the slums of New Delhi in 1999 a computer. And he didn't tell them anything about it, just a computer, a browser, and a mouse. And all of a sudden, within a short period of time, within minutes, they figured out how to use it. And by the end of the day, they were surfing the web. So what that tells us is something that's really important in education, that a person or a child by themselves can only learn so much. When you put people in a collaborative environment where they're working together, the results are exponentially increased. So with education, we need to be thinking about our alternatives to get the most out of our educational system. Unfortunately, there is a huge shortage, which I think many of you probably know about, uh, of teachers. Um, this is particularly in the grades K through 12. Uh, it exists uh, all over the country. And um, to say that it's gonna get worse, I think my next slide will show that. Um, there is a huge uh, shortage in, in those that are ready and willing to teach. Also, there seems to be a bit of a mismatch in terms of what we're teaching. And I know that I'm talking to a group of educators, so I, I tread carefully on this, but this is what I was reading in the book. And, and I have found this to be true on companies that I call on. They're saying, look, we're getting students that are not ready to do what we do. They're, they're educated, but some of the basic stuff of uh, arithmetic, uh, they don't have that. And so, there's going to be a contrast to this that I'm going to show you in just a minute why it's important to look at alternative ways to teach, even getting back to the basics, though, of arithmetic and statistics even sometimes. Um, so what's being taught and what they, we need when they get out into the real world and work may not always be the same, and I think our system, educational system has to review that. And what they're doing, uh, uh, most of us have probably heard of X Prize. Well, there is a new, oops, excuse me, there is a new X Prize that has been recently introduced in the area of education. And I thought I'd just show you this uh, from the YouTube. When I grow up, I want to be doctor. Doctor. Nurse. 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 When I grow up, I want to be doctor. When I grow up, I want to be a professor. Scientist. Designer. I want to help people. Teacher. Actress. Engineer. Basketball player. Turns out, kids dream big no matter where they're from. Unfortunately, where they're from makes a big difference of whether or not they'll ever realize those dreams. You see, 250 million children from around the world cannot read, write, or do basic arithmetic. Many live in developing countries without regular access to schools or teachers, and it would take over one and a half million additional teachers to meet this unserved need. It's clear, this traditional approach will not scale. We simply cannot build enough schools or train enough teachers. But what if technology could help? At XPRIZE, we use incentive competitions to inspire technology that can solve our grand challenges. In 1996, we offered $10 million for the first private spaceship to carry three adults to 100 kilometers altitude. One in 2004, it kicked off today's personal spaceflight revolution. Then in 2010, following the BP oil spill, our XPRIZE improved oil spill cleanup technology by 600%. Next, we launched the $10 million competition to bring the Star Trek tricorder to life and give us a world of healthcare abundance. But now, now we need your help to solve the most critical challenges ever, bringing literacy to hundreds of millions of kids around the world. That's why we're launching the Global Learning X Prize. We're challenging teams from around the globe 
to develop tablet-based software solutions that will take any child from illiteracy to basic reading, writing, and numeracy in just 18 months. We expect hundreds, maybe thousands of teams to enter this X Prize. From a thousand teams, we'll down select to a top five finalist and test their software in Africa with 5,000 kids. 18 months later, we'll crown a winner. But perhaps best of all, the winning solution is then going to be made open source to benefit all of humanity. So far, we've raised $15 million in prize money to incentivize this future. Our goal is an expensive community supporting this vision, making sure it reaches the finishing line. Support this campaign and you'll have access to some incredible perks. You'll have the opportunity to download a beta. Now it gets into a little bit of um, why you need to donate. Um, when I was talking about the shortage of teachers in the US, the, what goes on in the rest of the world, as you can see there, is so far different from what we have here. We have it quite quite good. What we need to do is maybe refine what we're working with here in this country. But to create this abundance in education, there is a couple issues. One is the demand for school buildings. Uh, we, can't, we can't build enough school buildings to meet that demand in terms of the late, having the latest technology. In some cases we have too many school buildings, but they're outdated. Um, we just have to look for different ways to, to do things in this country in terms of educating. And I thought it might be interesting to see how video games, and, and, I, and I just never thought this would even come to my mind as a, as a way to, to educate, but it is showing up that video games are having a fairly good success in educating some of our students. Um, Myself, uh, I, I haven't uh, totally grasped that, but this is the video on that. The way we learn today is just wrong. Learning needs to be less like memorization and more like Angry Birds. Fifty percent of school dropouts name boredom as the number one reason that they left. How do we get our kids to want? to learn. The challenge is in the old style educational system, you start at an A and every time you get something wrong, your score gets lower and lower and lower. In the gaming world, it's just the opposite. You start with zero and every time you call up something right, your score gets higher and higher and higher. It completely flips the way we currently learn. Think about what you do when you play a game. You observe the problem, you form a hypothesis, and then you test that hypothesis. And ultimately, you learn and you try it again. It's actually the same as the scientific method. The trick is to make kids as addicted to learning as they are to gaming. I want to share a story, one of the most compelling examples that I've ever heard of gamification. Proteins are the basic build block of your cells and for the longest time predicting how a protein folds has been a very difficult problem a group of graduate students asked the question is the ability of the human brain to able to predict protein folding better than the computer and they created a game called fold it in which the user gets a protein and then begins to manipulate and fold it on the screen. The lower the stress and strain on that protein molecule, the better their score. Well, it turned out that humans were much better at folding proteins. It turned out that the best protein folder was a woman who during the day was an executive secretary at a rehab clinic and who at night became the best protein folder on the planet. Gaming outperforms textbooks in every area. Customized gaming teaches creativity and innovation. Pilots and surgeons trained on video games outperform those who are not. So where is this all going? The future of education is an AI that can teach my child or your child and gives them an education that's so personalized, so perfect, that the wealthiest people on the planet would never be able to afford it. That's a future in which education is much better than we can possibly ever imagine. Because I saw that particular video, I went out, I have a five-year-old grandson, and I went out and got him Math Blaster. Mm -hmm. And because he uses um, video games already way too much for me. But uh, I thought maybe this would be a great way for him to get educated while playing games. And has anyone ever uh, used Math Blaster? I, I haven't used Math Blaster. I don't know if anyone else has. Has anyone else used it? 
Obviously, yeah. I've seen a number of video games to teach literacy and basic math skills. And I, I think I can see where he's going with that, like basic skills building in video games. I think I can also go with him on surgical techniques, visual, uh, tactile, and, and uh, fine motor response, and uh, stress reaction time response, like fighter pilots. I mean, I, I don't know, have any of you ever used um, flight simulators? They're a lot of fun. You can buy, you can buy, I, you know, Microsoft has a flight simulator. You can buy it, you can fly all kinds of aircraft. So they're all really cool and, and they are fun. But, you know, like one of the things that bothers me with this is how they act like everything about learning should always be, it's always going to be super fun. And not, not that it's not fun. It can be very fun. But sometimes learning is an effort. An effort. Course, an effort, yeah. There has to be a willingness to, if you're going to really understand, not just get a good score on protein folding, right? But understand how do proteins work? How do proteins, uh, you know, get constructed from the, you know, uh, genomic scale all the way up and, and push forward discovery in that area? That requires so much you know, not just fine motor skill development or reacting well under pressure or, you know, having the fun, but spending time and truly understand that pushes forward knowledge in very deep ways. I'm not sure we can always get that on a computer, you know? Yeah. It's not a lot related with a computer right now um, that can show us outside of interacting with a mentor or colleague how to put some of those basics together and, and think deeply and develop potential systems that can then, you know, be tested to push scientific discovery forward deeply. I mean, I agree with them about the basic skills kind of thing. Yeah, you can, I mean, even, even the example that he gave, okay, manipulating the computer. Remember how he took that one step further? where he had set a computer station out and they all seemed to pick up on that right away. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. I can get on the internet. I can surf. Oh yeah. yeah. And then, but yeah, then yeah. he wanted them to learn the basics of, um, pro, you know, protein synthesis and genetics. And he was able to get them to where they could use some of the terminology, but they couldn't put it together. What does it mean to alter or, or shift the induction of a gene sequence to create a synthesized protein. I mean, you don't get that out of just messing around with the computer and, and doing that with other people and having that organically develop. I mean, that is something that took many years of many researchers working together deeply and sometimes in not so fun ways, right? <laughs> like you had to make a sacrifice and work for a long time to get a little bit of data that you then passed on to someone else that they then carried forward a little further. So I, I like some of the stuff that's said, and then I also think about some of the other aspects of that, you know? I think part of what he's trying to get at, too, is that, like I think you indicated, Dr. Zeman, and that is some of the basic information in how you get there by creating um, an environment where they want to learn. And then, then you take that to the next stage. Because uh, you I, create I, a foundation where there's some fun in yeah. what they're doing. Right. So that so gives they, the person it, it creates within a person a desire yep. to, you know, as they go on in life, sacrifice to learn something sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. OK, okay good at it. Well, um, for sake of time, I'm going to have to move pretty quickly here. Um, the uh, they, they talked about artificial intelligence. And I, I thought I'd, I'd, sh I'd share this video with you here at this page here, um, because I thought th this addresses it kind of in a neat way. Hey guys, does this day sound familiar? You go oh, to a confusing lecture. With artificial intelligence in this case, we're talking about taking students who need additional help and who have to go to a tutor. But tutors are expensive, and I didn't realize this. Um, this might be an affordable way for people to learn who need this little extra help to get motivated, shall we say. You ask for help, 
but your teacher can't explain anything. So you have to stay up way too late struggling with homework, and then the next day you do it all again. And again, and again, and again. By the time the test day comes around, you might as well have stayed home. You know a tutor could help, but good ones cost a lot and are hard to schedule. There's lots of free videos on YouTube, but it takes forever to find everything you need. And most of them don't explain anything better than your teacher. Some were even made by your teacher. That's when you find ThatTutorGuy.com. Their videos cover every topic in your class. And the guy in the videos is a tutor, not a teacher. So he has tons of practice explaining these topics to normal students just like you. Plus and that's just sort of just a um, point of view there. Um, and it again meant for probably, I have a five-year-old that probably could use a little extra help. And so that's why I'm trying the math yeah. after with him. But, but notice what's behind that, the tutor guy. You're basically buying his videos and buying his time. Oh, but yeah. Distributed to them. So then you get the tutor guy's time. Yeah. Um, which is a cool idea. I mean, I, I really love the whole idea of artificial intelligence being a functional platform. In fact, recently, I emailed the head of the library sciences at UNI with an article that was about how good AI is becoming. And I asked him, hey, is there any vision for the library to have any sort of AI portal for research purposes? Because I would love to be able to go to the computer, like on Star Trek and say, computer, could you find studies between these years that have these parameters and then discuss that with the computer or have them pull out aspects for me and then say, could you graph that for me? I mean, that would be great. That would be fascinating, wonderful, and I think I could do really good things with that. But what it's always going to be, but to me, it seems like it's going to be enhancing human creativity and sort of a co-creative process. Well, yeah, because you've done it before, so you understand the process. Where if someone who had never done that had that done from, what would they have learned? I think yeah, maybe, exactly. maybe yeah. not nothing. Yeah. Okay. Not enough. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, then um, let me move into the next area, which was healthcare, uh, creating abundance in that area. And as we do that over time, one of the main areas we're looking to do is provide for clean water, ample, ample nutrition, and clean air. And it's with the use of energy that we are able to actually accomplish some of these things. Um, it certainly, as you can read there, it, it talks about reduction in pandemics and chronic diseases. Those are byproducts and results of uh, improved healthcare abundance. Um, but we have an issue. We, we sort of like in the area with teaching, we have an issue of shortages of healthcare workers. And these were the statistics that partly came from the book. And the United States, uh, I just used the United States and Africa as a comparison, but the deficit exists around the world and it's only gonna get worse the way it looks. Um, I wanted to show you this because I uh, just had a son who went through medical school and the reality of what he had to deal with is this exact one that you're going to see here. So right or wrong, this is what this one gentleman who was running for a political office in the state of New York had to say about Medicare funding. Hey guys, Brandon Kirshner here, independent candidate for New York's 25th district in the House of Representatives. I just got off an ER shift here and I wanted to take a moment to discuss America's current doctor shortage uh, that we're currently experiencing. So over the last shift, we had five or six big emergencies come into the ER. But in between those emergencies, we had 30 to 40 uh, non-emergent cases present. Cases like abdominal pain, chronic back pain, uh, glucose tests, uh, insulin injections, uh, prescription refills, suture removal, things that a primary care doctor can and should um, take care of. And the problem with coming into the ER with a non-emergent case is at the end of the day, you're still going to get tacked on with an emergency room sized bill, $500, $600, dollars just to see an ER doc. We're happy to have you, we're happy to see you, we're always open, uh, but just keep in mind that it is way more expensive than going to see your primary care physician. So the first thing I ask when I go into a room uh, for a non-emergent case is, have you seen your primary care yet? Do they know about this problem? Are they following up? And oftentimes the answer is no. And I ask why, 
And the answer is always the same. I tried to get into my primary care's office, uh, but he's booked until uh, the summertime. I tried to make an appointment, but they're booked for six weeks. The only appointment they had was Tuesday at 6.30 in the morning, uh, and so on and so forth. And keep in mind that it is not the primary care's physician's fault. I know some primary care docs who are taking the maximal patients, they're working the maximal hours, they're working two, three, four uh, clinics just to keep up with the demand of our growing population. The problem lies with, the, with that there is a greater demand for primary care than there is a supply of primary care. And it has to do with the federal government not supporting and expanding graduate medical education at the federal level. Over the next 10 years, we're going to see an increase of 17% uh, in the demand for primary care physicians. And Congress currently does not have a plan, zero plan, for meeting that demand with a greater supply. When a, when a hospital creates... Okay. Um, I would just tell you that my own personal experience uh, from talking to my, own, my son about this is that in his field, there was only 180 positions available in the entire United States, and uh, he's a radiation oncologist. And his girlfriend, in her position as a primary care physician, there are 14,000 openings. We have a huge shortage in this country, and it is be for many reasons, partly because cost, commitment, and the government sort of standing in the way um, for uh, funding. That's That's... As you all know, that uh, Medicare has been under some tight constraints, and it does affect our physicians. So all of this is about abundance, not shortages, right? So how is there abundance in healthcare? Well, what we're doing is we're using technology to drive the use of data collection, and that technology is providing for a higher level of care, given the amount of people we have available to do it. Um, and I don't know if any of you have seen the new Papa John Biomedical Institute facility in Iowa City. It opened in 2014. There's a picture of it. It is a phenomenal facility. It really is the cutting edge of technology. And it is all there just for the purpose of getting answers to some of the diseases and finding out what the cause is. Um, Again, here is uh, something that is being done using technology. Uh, some of this you may have heard of before, uh, where they can actually put a pill down, you can swallow it, and it has the ability through uh, internet, I believe, or is it Bluetooth, one of the two, to communicate with a data collection outside of your body and provide inside information to what's going on. I mean, this is technology at work in the area of um, healthcare. Just recently, uh, last week, the uh, Corridor Business Journal came out with all kinds of comments about healthcare costs and how we're using like, technology to improve the quality and to help reduce costs because we have a tremendous issue with the cost of healthcare in this country. And then as far as patient monitoring goes, um, there's a lot more being done with the, uh, yeah, I, know, I just talked to someone last week who said that they, their mother was, had a device in their house that was monitoring all of her, uh, health condition and she would wait, get weighed and it would send it out. I mean, all of this is going on right now, even here in Iowa and the YouTube that's tied to, to this is interesting. You could watch that on your own. I think, uh, I just want to get to the last part of this quickly. Um, the, the, the freedom that results uh, from all of this technology that comes into play is, is something that is seen in very um, important ways throughout the world. I use this example. It came from the book, and at first I thought, I don't know if I want to use this, but basically the organization, which is known as FARC in Colombia, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, um, they used Facebook to build their strength. So it was that form of communication that got people on board with them. Um, and it's, it's good to know just recently that the, they've been dismantled and there's some peace that's starting to exist now in Colombia. Um, additionally, uh, technology could have been used to a greater extent in the, uh, in, um, with, with Saddam Hussein. Uh, there was no cell phone structure at all in that country and we spent 800 plus billion dollars, and I'm not getting on my own 
uh, soapbox here, but uh, the reality is, is we spent money maybe we didn't have to because we could have created uh, the same kind of end result if we could, would have gone and just created a wireless infrastructure and used that to empower the Iraqi citizens. Again, not my position necessarily, but I certainly believe that's a possibility. Um, I think right now, uh, as we get through this, um, the fact that we're using innovation to uh, drive us to create more technology, there's going to be risks in this process. And um, there are certain elements of, of, of this um, innovation, the curiosity, the fear, the creating wealth and the desire that all make up a significant a part of what we have to do uh, to achieve a greater level of uh, advancement. Um, incentive prizes, that is a, an excellent way to do it. There, you're, you saw some examples of that. Um, here's an example of a failure. Uh, there has to be risk when you, when you go into this area of technology. Apple failed with their first PDA back in Oh gosh, I forget the, the year exactly it was, but it's called the Newton, I do remember it. And so they took that same product and a few years later came around 2007, it became invention of the year and it was called the iPhone. So, you know, with failure comes success uh, as we work through it. Um, and then this, I think because of time, I won't be able to probably go into this much, but I, there's two examples here of how we've used technology to uh, provide success in the area of space exploration. I just wanted you to see part of this uh, Land Rover from 2012. I don't know if many of you have ever seen this. This just uh, was amazing to see. This is a simulation, by the way. Show you that it just real quick here's how we did it 
a dozen years or so before. Yeah. You talk about technology at work. This is, that's what we did. We put it inside of, a, a underneath a parachute and put um, balloons around it. Basically they were like, there's no volume to this one. They're like airbags from a car. It was something we wanted to try. People said it wouldn't work and it did work. Cause right there, it, it opens up and a rover comes out. That was our first rover on Mars. So it is technology that's changing everything for us. I think in the beginning of the book, it was, it was pretty clear that we are in an era, era of uh, possibility and that things are changing. And as a result, uh, we've got great opportunities ahead of us. It really is the people who are being educated today at, at the university level and the junior colleges who are bringing to us all kinds of uh, new technology and new opportunities to progress and be better and create that abundance that we want. That's what I got. Great. Am I on time? 4.59. Yeah, <laughs> one or two minutes, right? Yeah. I, I like your I like your feedback. I like your conclusion, Mark, and it reminds me of the last the last bits of information in these chapters, how a new technology opens the adjacent possible. Yeah. Leading from one thing to another. And um, you know, a lot of times I don't know if we even know what that next thing will be. You know, um, that's why we have to keep creating. We got work to do in some areas, that's for sure, don't we? Are we there? Yes, we are. I think so. Okay. Are there any final comments from anybody else? Janu, anybody else in the audience or anything? Um. <laughs> no, have, have, we, have we lost everyone here at the very end? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Is there anybody else out there connected on the internet that wants to say something? Well, I've, I've really enjoyed um, this uh, book club reading on abundance and I'd like to say thank you to Janu for working to put together the sessions and working with, uh, so Janu Shrestha and Farah Kishef, thank you very much for putting all of that together for the rest of us. Yep, thank you. For all the people that signed up and, and have participated in a different session. So I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. And this was a great presentation, Mark. There were so many good videos and, and so much good information in there. And I do appreciate right now that you're still feeling optimistic. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I, I worry sometimes. Do you, do you worry that we could miss the, the timeline chronologically, that we could... Or are you feel confident that we will will move forward in a it, you know? I, I could say I'm selfish because I want to see it, and maybe I won't. But I know we have to. I don't think we have any choice. We have to progress. We have to move forward, mm -hmm. and we have to do it as quickly as we can to create abundance in all areas. Yeah, good good points. Okay, well, thank you. Nothing from the other side. Then I guess Janu. You better conclude our Abundance Book Club. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Goodbye.